Hello, BookTube. I went to the Brattle Bookshop this morning. <laughs> and it's a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston. It's fantastic. Three busy floors, stacked shelves, constantly out buying, constantly bringing things up from the basement and pricing them to put out, and also a sale lot next door that's huge. It's, it's full of bargain books, $1, $3, and $5. No other arrangement than price, so it's a browser smorgasbord. You can just spend an endless amount of time out there, as I would know, since I have done that. <laughs> and I had reasons to go to, 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 the, to the bookstore today. I know that we all are experts at coming up with justifications for the fact that we went out and got more books. <laughs> And I'm an expert at that, too, of course. So I have three reasons. I had three reasons why I went to the Brattle Bookshop. One is that the other day I was walking the bean and found a bookcase. It often happens to me. People put bookcases out on the sidewalk, and I found one. And the minute I looked at it on the sidewalk, I thought, that is not just a good fit, but a perfect fit for one open space on a wall. There literally won't be more than a millimeter on either side. It will slide right in. It is the exact same size as that opening. And I was near enough uh, to Hyde Cottage, so I just grabbed it. So that's justification number one. Justification number two is that I just had a friend over, uh, stayed overnight to, uh, to have some wine and talk about books, and I was seeing him off uh, as he left this morning. So I was going to be out and about anyway. And uh, justification number three is that one of the lines of the MBTA, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, affectionately, or maybe not affectionately known as the T, the subway system here in Boston, is a central hub and then multicolored lines that branch out into all sorts of different directions. And one whole line of the T is shutting down tonight for a month. Not a couple of stops and not every weekend. The whole thing, from front to back, is shouting down for a month. Uh, which is going to make the brattle a little bit harder, a little bit more tedious for me to get to. So I had a whole bunch of justif justifying reasons to go. So I went, and I got a bunch of books. And I want to show them to you. Uh, the, we'll start. I got one mass market paperback, and I've had this before. Uh, I don't know what became of my copy. I think I must have sold it or given it away to somebody. But this is by John Wilcox, and it's called The Horns of the Buffalo. Uh, it's a novel about Rourke's Drift, uh, which was a, a signature battle in the Zulu Wars that has a great chapter in The Washing of the Spears, that, that great big book on the Zulu Wars, and uh, was also a, a, a necessary addendum. I just recently read a popular history of uh, Rourke's Drift, of the Battle of Rourke's Drift, which is uh, sort of a kind of a spin-off of a much bigger battle, uh, a bunch of a bunch of it goes hand in hand with one other battle in in the uh, the Zulu Wars, and this is not a history of that. It, I read a history just recently that I liked quite a bit. I can't off the top of my head remember the name of the author of that, but uh, I really enjoyed it. I don't read as much on the Zulu Wars as I as I should, considering how dramatic it is uh, and how interesting it is. I I read, of course, the Washing of the Spears, and I really really liked it. I don't at the moment have a copy. Last time someone asked me if I had, if I knew of a good book on the subject, I immediately suggested that and then immediately sent it to them. Uh, but it'll turn out. The Brattle will provide. But uh, this is a UK, a UK mass market paperback, and it's a novel about Rourke's Drift uh, that I've had once before. But I know when I had it, I didn't buy it. I, I didn't read it. I, I got it, and it sort of sat around. Can't for the life of me imagine what attracted me to buying it. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't actually get to it. So this time I will. Probably this weekend. Uh, then this next thing uh, is for the gays. you got to have something for the gays when you go shopping for books. This is a murder mystery. Uh, in this, who, who does this? This is, yes, yes, the old gay men's press, which in the United States looked like this. All of the spines looked like this. So you had the split down the middle, and then the title and the author were split in black by a white line. Uh, and they, they had a huge run of books. They don't exist as far as I know anymore. But this is a murder mystery. This is called A Dangerous Thing. And it's the second uh, murder mystery featuring Adrian English. So I don't, it's by Josh Lehman, and I don't have the first one. 
and I'm not sure. Does this tell me what the first one was? I, I'm, I'm not sure that I've ever read it. Fatal Shadows was the first one. Uh, probably it will turn up. I mean, what are the chances that someone got rid of this at the Brattle and didn't get rid of the first one? The only thing that might hamper me finding the first one is that a lot of times in the Brattle sale lot, if somebody comes across a series of books and they're not really sure about it, they'll just get the first volume and leave all the others there. Uh, so it could be that I'll never see it. But again, when it comes to murder mysteries in series, I am hoping that the author has done his job. I'm hoping that that this is not completely reliant on me having read the first book. Uh, so what have we got here? In this second LA-based adventure, bookseller, that's what drew me to this, is that it, the, uh, the main character is a bookseller. Adrian English arrives at the Pine Shadow Ranch left to him by a beloved grandmother, only to find a corpse in his driveway. Uh, but by the time the unfriendly local sheriffs arrive, the body has disappeared. Who are the mysterious strangers excavating on his land? And will he sort out his problems with LAPD, LAPD detective Jake Reardon? Heavily, <laughs> heavily into S&M, but not so hot on relationships. <laughs> well, well, then what do you mean you're going to sort out your problems? <laughs> do you think you can fix them? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> we strayed from a, a missing dead body to TMI in record time. Uh, find out in this engrossing, slyly witty thriller. We shall see. I certainly will. Uh, then this next one, it's also for the gays. <laughs> this is, I don't know. It, the thing about the Brattle sale lot, which is where I do most of my shopping, I hardly ever buy things in the store. Uh, the thing about the sale lot is that everything out there is so cheap that even at $5, it, it's, it, you, can, you can fill an arm with books before you run out of money. So you can take a gamble on things. If you see something that's a dollar, you can you can gamble on it no matter what. So I did. <laughs> I did gamble on that. This is called, it's by Max Pierce, uh, and it's called The Master of Seacliff. I'll make sure that, you, that we're doing justice to this cover. I don't want to block the beam. That is the cover. <gasps> uh, the young man looks really worried as he wanders around outside in stonework, carrying only a candle. And I'm thinking maybe he wouldn't be quite so worried if he didn't do his outdoor wandering wearing a towel. <laughs> it's, maybe, you know, you put on some clothes like a normal person, maybe a pair of shoes, you might feel a little bit more secure in your surroundings. <laughs> but, but that's just me. Uh, so, uh, what have we got here? The year is 1899. That's still no excuse for calivanting around in your, in your towel. Uh, and Andrew Wyndham is 20 years old, no longer a boy, but not yet the man he longs to become. Half the British Army in 1899 was people who were 20 years old. Uh, brought up, I'm thinking that Andrew is not the Army type, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, let's see here. Brought up by harsh and stingy relatives in New York City, young Andrew dreams of life as an artist. He has talent, but lacks the resources to bring his dreams to fruition. When a friend arranges for him to, uh, to tutor the son of a wealthy arts patron at an estate called Seacliff, Andrew sees a chance to make his dreams come true. But danger lurks everywhere, and nothing is quite as it seems, including Duncan Stewart, the handsome and mysterious master of the house. Mm -hmm. So if Andrew hears uh, knocking and screaming in the night, it's possible that the mysterious and enigmatic master of Seacliff has a boy toy in the attic. <laughs> Oh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna prejudge the matter. It's not a long thing, so a lot of these things I will probably get to really soon, uh, and the ones that I don't, I have a luxurious bookcase that I can put them in. <laughs> that, I'm not stacking books. I'm not double stacking books. I'm not overcrowded at the moment. So, uh, then this next one, I had this once as a mass market paperback eons ago. I couldn't believe I found it as hardcover at the Brattle today. This is by Robert Murphy, and with pictures by Bob Hines, and it's called The Stream. There we have a snowy owl whose day is about to get really bad. <laughs> and this has illustrations all throughout. This is another one. These lovely uh, pencil illustrations. Let me see if I can find one. Yeah, here we go. There's raccoons tormenting a porcupine. Again, a really bad idea and not for the porcupine. Uh, and this is a story. It's a kind of a quasi-novel about a young man named Olmstead who's wandering around a particular patch of wilderness in the Poconos, a stream and the wilderness around it and learning the wildlife. Now there's, if I remember correctly, good Lord, it's been forever since I read this thing. 
Did I just pass another picture? Might as well show you another picture. Oh, yes, there we go. There's a deer chasing a little fox. The pictures are absolutely lovely. I remember that from the mass market paperback. God knows what happened to that mass market paperback. This came out in uh, 1971. It's entirely possible that it was printed in paperback in 1972, and probably that's when I read it, but, and, and not since then. I seem to remember that the, the vague vestige of a plot in this thing was very secondary to the lovely descriptions of nature and the appreciations of nature. But I could be wrong about that. It'll be a, it'll be a blast from the past. Uh, then this next one, another example of what you can do at the Brattle, because the books are so cheap outside, they're a dollar, three dollars, is you can buy a double. You can you can sort of reinforce, so to speak, your own personal library with doubles and extra choices because you're not out a lot of money. I just recently reread a murder mystery here and broke the spine. <laughs> I reinforced the trade paperback, but I broke the spine anyway because I love the book and I've read it a lot. And when I'm grappling with a book, if I'm not being extra conscious about it, I can be very rough. Uh, and this was the book, Original Sin by P.D. James. And I found it in a hardcover that will take a lot more work for even me to destroy. Uh, and this is a, a Dowglish mystery about a publishing house, an odd, quirky little publishing house in London that where eventually, in the course of the book, a murder is committed. A, a young go-getting executive who wants to turn the publishing house around, cut the fat, get rid of the eccentricities, and start to have the place make money. Uh, he's found dead. <laughs> Any of you who have ever worked in a bookstore will know that when a manager, a new manager like that comes on the scene, you're just hoping they end up in the break room with a pen knife in their heart. And that's what actually happens in this book. And Dalgis has a ton of suspects. But they're all bookish people, so it's hard to imagine any of them committing the crime. Uh, and the thing, I mean, I love this because it's all bookish. The, the main, the, the, the sleuth is a published author. Uh, is a, a full excursion into the bookish world, the publishing world, and whatnot. But the main thing I love about it is the thing I love about all of P.G. James' novels, which is that, yes, there's a murder mystery, uh, but it's a novel. This is, it, it's a, this is a novel in which a murder takes place rather than a murder mystery that reads like a novel. This is atmospheric. The characters are three-dimensional. The, the motivations are murky and complex because that's the way motivations are in human beings not because that's the way the author wants to make the motivation so you can't guess the ending. All of the usual trickery and, much as I love it, uh, shallow machinery of murder mysteries, virtually none of that exists in, the, in P.D. James's novels, and that's why I tend to love them. Uh, so, and this one is my favorite. This is my favorite P.D. James. So I know what I want, and this is not it. This was a dollar, so... I'm perfectly happy to invite it into my ample, ample shelf space. But I know what I want. I want the UK trade paperback of this, of this book, which I've never even seen. I have the UK trade paperbacks of a couple of P.D. James. They're very durable. I just spent, what, uh, a month and a half reading the Canadian trade paperback of The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel, and I did not destroy it. They're very durable. And that's what I want. That is what I want. But... Who knows when I'll see that at the Brattle Bookshop, so I grabbed this instead. Very nice to have it as a hardcover. I'll just put it on the shelf uh, with the trade paperback that I destroyed. Or maybe I'll just give the trade paperback that I destroyed a burial. There's no sense in keeping a destroyed book on your shelf. Uh, then this next one was born. This is another, another familiar Brattle tick for me, is that often something new that I'm reading uh, will produce curiosities in me or hungers in me that then a trip to the brattle satisfies and i just recently finished i need to grapple with it because i want to write about it i just recently finished a book called audubon at sea uh which is not just a study of all of the non bird or the aquatic bird studies that Aud john james audubon did but also the other meaning of the title audubon at sea which is that it's an ongoing reassessment of audubon the man uh, who is in the slow motion process of being retroactively canceled as a person. People have to go on and on. The, the two authors of Audubon at Sea had to make a point over and over again of the fact that the Audubon Society took Audubon's name without his knowledge. He was dead when it happened. 
So they are not complicit. They don't have to rename themselves. But uh, Audubon was an odious person. Now there are, you can you it's you'd steal his choice as to how he was odious. You could you could pick your way on how he was odious. Did he treat his apprentices and co-workers well? No. Did he treat his friends and family well? No. Did he own slaves? Yes. Did he defend the owning of slaves? Yes. Did he walk through pristine wildlands, killing everything he could see, acting as, as he himself described it, a monster with a gun? Yes, he did. He did. For a long time, for 70 years of, of Audubon studies after he died, the standard idea was, well, that was the way they did things. You shoot these animals in order to accurately draw them and set them up. You, mo you, can't, you can't observe them well enough to draw them in the wild. You have to kill them and then mount them in action positions. And that's for the benefit of science. That's for the benefit of ornithology, uh, which uh, there's never a beneficial reason to kill someone who's just sitting on their eggs. <laughs> but even if that were true, you'd only need one whooping crane or you know brown pelican you wouldn't need to kill everyone you see and audubon did and also paid other people to do it too drop in the bucket compared to industrialization killing these birds but still in other words he's what's the word problematic <laughs> he's a problematic figure uh and i gather i wasn't aware until i read audubon at sea uh, but I gather now that his retroactive cancellation is in full swing. Uh, and probably after Audubon at Sea, there will be no other uh, just soup-to-nuts biographies of this figure. It just won't happen. Publishers won't want to touch it. Uh, but when I was reading that book, I was remembering the full-scale autobiographies of this figure that I have read and loved and was thinking, gee, it'd be nice if I ran across one of those just to read the pre-cancellation biographical treatment of Audubon. This is a line now. What about reading a pre-cancellation biography? And I found the best one of them all uh, by Richard Rhodes. Uh, I barely found it, as you can see. The, ordinarily, the books outside in the sale lot uh, don't look like this. This has been warped by uh, water and a little bit by the sun. Uh, it's, it's salvageable, and, and be, I don't need it to look good. I'm glad to find it. This is the one that I wanted, so very happy to reread this, especially in, in conjunction with that book. I'll probably reread that book before I write a review of Audubon at Sea, which I think is a September release. Uh, then this next one also springs from a book. Uh, I recently re read and reviewed for the Martha's Vineyard Gazette a new biography of the late Washington Post humor columnist Art Buckwald. It was a, a genial, fairly shallow book, but um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I think you would enjoy it quite a bit if you want a glimpse of political satire in another age, an age that's never coming back, a kind of political satire that cannot possibly be done in the 21st century anymore. Uh, it was also a pretty good portrait of Buckwald, although I think it was clearly meaning to like him. Uh, and maybe there was nothing to dislike. <laughs> it's not the stories that I've heard, but maybe... Maybe those stories didn't have any grounding. But when I was reading that book, that book is uh, full of letters. Buckwald kept up an, an, an extremely enormous correspondence with everyone. Every writer in the world wanted to write to him and wanted him to write to them. And although bigger, more serious names kept coming up, like, for instance, William Styron, one name that kept coming up over and over again was the novelist Irwin Shaw, who wrote The Young Lions. He wrote Rich Man, Poor Man. Uh, and... I realized, I remembered when I was reading that Art Buckwald biography, that Irwin Shaw comes up a lot in a lot of letters, a lot of them. Robert Lowell, also Bill Styron, William Styron himself, also had a collection of letters, and Shaw is all over it. And that made me think, I think I said it on a video, that made me think, well, should I reread Rich Man, Poor Man? Should I do that? I don't particularly want to. It isn't all that good a book. Uh, and then sure enough, the minute I thought that, the next time I went to the Brattle, I found one of those omnibus editions that had three Shaw novels in a rather attractive design. Big doorstop of a thing. Had Rich Man, Poor Man. It had the, the sequel, Beggar Man, Thief. And I think it had Evenings in Byzantium, something like that, for the third book. And I had it in my hand at the Brattle. And I thought, okay, I'm fascinated by Irwin Shaw. It's too bad that no one's ever going to write a biography of him. He seems like a fascinating figure. 
unlike some of the literary lions that he rubbed elbows with in the mid 20th century, he wasn't lucky. Uh, despite the fact that uh, movies were made of some of his books, despite the uh, fact that a miniseries, a TV miniseries, a very successful one was made of Rich Man, Poor Man, his books did not live. They died. Uh, so he was a writer of his time, but he's not a writer of our time in a way that you could say about, for instance, William Styron. Uh, or Robert Lowell, good lord, a ticket to that kind of immortality if you want it is to be a great poet. Uh, I, but I thought, I am interested, but I don't think I'm 1,500 pages interested in his novels. I don't think I am. So I put that volume back, and I couldn't help but notice today that it's still there. No one wants, even for $3, no one wants Rich Man, Poor Man by Irwin Shaw. Good lord. If, if you could go back 50 years into a bookstore and just magically appear in front of any random bookshopper and say, here's a great big volume of these famous three novels by Irwin Shaw. And I, it's $3. I won't even charge you tax. You'd have been mobbed with people. He was, he was the talk of the town. He sold millions and millions of books, made an enormous pile of money off his books, and he's gone now. He's completely gone. Uh, but I put that book back, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, but you had a second thought, right? And grabbed it again. No, no. Even in the Brattle sale lot, I try to retain some self-control. Rather than buy a book I know I don't want, which is the ultimate lack of self-control. But I found this uh, when I was there. And I did grab it. This is uh, a gigantic volume of Irwin Shaw short stories. Five decades of short stories. Got a little bit of damage here, but I can fix that. Put a, a piece of paper down there. Uh, fold all of this down color that piece of paper black, it'll be fine. There is our author looking all serious. He very seldom wore a serious face in life. But this is a gigantic collection of 60-something short stories. And he wrote short stories for anybody and everybody. He was everywhere. I know at the time, you know, the short story writer that Penguin has adopted, the short story writer that Modern Library has adopted, the short story writer that we are now being told we are supposed to like and maybe even venerate is John O'Hara. But Erwin Shaw wrote in just as many places for just as good of money. Uh, and this is a ton of those stories. So, uh, if I remember correctly, it has a really touchingly uh, unaffected introduction. Yeah, I am a product of my times. I remember the end of World War I, the bells and whistles and cheering. And as an adolescent, I profited briefly from the boom years. I suffered the, de the depression, exalted at the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, drank my first glass of legal beer the day Prohibition ended, mourned over Spain, listened to the communist sirens, sensed the coming of World War II, went to that war, was shamed by the McCarthy era, saw the rebirth of Europe, marveled at the new generation of students, admired Kennedy, mourned over Vietnam. I have been both praised and blamed, all the while living my private life the best way I could. Uh, I'm perfect. I, rich man, poor man, maybe is, is a bridge too far, but I'm perfectly happy to have a big collection. I have a, a weakness for big collections or short stories anyway, but I'm perfectly happy to, to re-experience Irwin Shaw this way, right? A short story, one of the, the great saving benefits of a huge collection of short stories is that you're not committed to a lifelong marriage. If you, if you read a short story that takes you 15 minutes and you didn't particularly like it, you don't have to read the next one for a year. <laughs> you can put the book back on the shelf. I don't ever let things sit that long, but short stories are great for that way. You can dip in and you can dip out. And that, so that's, this is great. This is the perfect uh, compromise with my curiosity about Irwin Shaw. And there's another book. There's another literary biography coming out. Uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on all the details. It's, there's a literary biography coming out in the early part of next year. Another mid-20th mid century literary figure. I'm hoping that that is a trend. I want these mid-20th century literary figures to be studied. They barely get any serious study now, and I want them to, especially the women. The women hardly get any studies, and yet the women were absolutely dominant in the mid-century. Norman Mailer and John Updike get all the headlines, but every serious translation, every serious academic work, almost every serious academic acquisition, a lot of serious novels on both sides of the Atlantic, of course, two of the greatest American poets ever to put pen to paper. I, I'm looking forward to, to more studies of mid-20th century literature. 
But uh, there's one coming out early next year that's going to have Erwin Shaw letters all over it. It's just gonna, it's, I'm going to be glad that I have this one. Uh, and then we'll we'll finish up. I I these two. It's just random chance that these two are at the end. But this gives you a little a little thumbnail if you want to duck out of the video early because the the last two things I found at the Brattle are comic book related. And I know that only a tiny fraction of you are interested in such things, so you can dip out now, and, and we'll see each other again uh, if I ever brave my the, another Brattle trip in, the next, in this upcoming month. Uh, but I found two two comic book related things that I couldn't leave behind, especially since they again were dirt cheap. And the first one is absolutely lovely. I haven't gone through this thing front to back. I don't think ever. This is by the great comic book artist Gil Kane. Uh, who did absolutely seminal work on virtually every character in Marvel and DC Comics over the course of 50 years. One of the greatest comic book artists of them all, one of my favorite comic book artists. And he did a, an original creation, which is a weird combination of science fiction and fantasy. This, Black Mark, this is the 30th anniversary collected edition of Black Mark. This is the whole of the story. Uh, Gil Kane decided to tell the story of Black Mark, which takes place in a kind of shattered, dystopian, post-apocalyptic world that has degenerated or maybe ascended to sword and sorcery, to exotic animals and heroes who don't have higher technology. Really good uh, combination of elements here. Gil Kane had a nose for that. He was an informal, idea-generating, co conversational partner to a whole bunch of writers who never credited him for, for a lot of the work that he did. Uh, and this is unconventional. It seems normal now in 2022, but when, it, when he started it decades ago, it was unconventional because it's a story with pictures. It's a, it's a novel that is, that is illustrated like a comic book. No one had ever tried to do anything like that before. Not on this, not on this scale. Uh, and it wasn't, as far as I know, commercially successful. I don't, I don't think the idea took off. Now, of course, we have a term. Now we call these things graphic novels. And we don't bat an eyelash at them. And some of them do very well. But I don't think there were many before this. Uh, and I don't think that this, to my knowledge, in, in trade journals like the Comic Book Journal or Amazing Heroes, I don't think this was ever referred to as a graphic novel. But it's a heck of a story with terrific Gil Kane artwork. You know, he, he, as good as he was doing licensed comic book characters like The Flash or Green Lantern, he was even better when he's doing stuff where he has total creative freedom. And he does in this. This was his. So, fantastic to find this. Very happy. And then this next thing... <laughs> this next thing was an indulgence. It was cheap, and I'm never going to see it again. And it's in perfect condition. This is an old Showcase Presents volume. Those of you who don't know anything about comics who have managed to stick around, there are two major superhero comic book publishers, Marvel and DC. And they both have 70 years of history behind them, of stories, story runs, comic books that have come and gone, been canceled, or that are still going. That's a huge backlog where you can slap together a reprint volume in however kind of form you want and make a really good profit. Because you're not paying anyone for new material. You're not paying anyone for the use of old material. It's yours. So the most you have to do is pay for a new formatting and maybe a new introduction, maybe new cover art. And in compensation for that expense, you know that you have a buying audience. You know that comic book fans of a certain age who have gradually bumbled their way into a little disposable income will buy that thing. And the two companies reacted towards that in radically different ways. Marvel Comics has embraced that idea. Their reprint culture is incredibly healthy. In fact, just a few years ago, they got back the franchise rights to Robert E. Howard's characters, uh, Conan, foremost among them, and I firmly believe that they bid for those rights solely so that they could reprint their whole run of Conan from 50 years ago. And, and they are doing that. They're in like 10 hardcover volumes, and fans have bought enough of those volumes to recoup the cost three times over. I firmly believe that Marvel didn't have much intention of writing and drawing any new Conan classics. I think they mainly just wanted the rights back so that they could reprint this stuff and literally have a license to print money. Uh, whereas DC Comics, <laughs> their reprint culture is pretty bad. 
it's a little bit better than it used to be. Only a few years ago, they didn't do any reprinting at all. Now they've sort of, kind of caught on to that fact. And for a while, years ago, they did showcase presents, which were big uh, black and white volumes. So they leached the color out of these comics, but that allowed them to lower the price. So you could get a, a showcase volume of reprints for comparatively little money. Marvel was doing the same thing at the time. I don't think either company is doing this at the moment. I think they've, that both companies have moved on to only full-color reprint volumes. And they find, I am sure, that the sales don't dip. The fans who are buying this want it as nice as you can make it. The only reason they bought the showcase editions or, or you know, uh, what, were, what were Marvel's called? something epic collections or something. Well, the, no, the epic collections are the new ones. And the only reason fans bought the old ones without any color in four-color superhero comics is because it's the only thing you were offering. You offer more, they'll buy more. Uh, and DC, I don't think, does showcase editions anymore, but they did for a while, and I found one that I had to get. This is the All-Star Squadron. <laughs> you see what I mean? This is, it's a big, fat volume. This was uh, only $20, and for that you get... No ads, no inserts, just a huge amount of black and white reprints of full-color superhero comic books. And this is uh, Roy Thomas. This is, Roy Thomas is sort of the informal historian of comic books, Marvel and DC. If you give him, if you gave him, in his heyday, if you gave him his free run on a title, he would immediately start proposing a title set in the past so that he could write great characters from the golden age of superheroes. Uh, and that's what he did here. He wanted to write the Justice Society of America the first superhero team of them all, a World War II superhero team from DC Comics, starring The Flash, uh, Green Lantern, uh, The Atom, Sandman, Dr. Fate, The Spectre. Uh, a, a really good, interesting lineup that uh, had its heyday. And the story in DC continuity is that eventually the, the Justice Society sort of disbanded. And there was one classic storyline where they were forced to disband because a very McCarthy-esque figure wanted them to reveal their secret identities, and they refused. However you, you do that, that's later. This is World War II, and this cover is a little bit deceptive. Just as society disbands, the All-Star Squadron is taking over. Really, this is just an adjunct in World War II, in, set in the years of World War II. It's a different superhero team where Roy Thomas went through the second rate and also ran characters. He didn't want the All-Star Squadron to be the major characters. The World War II era Batman, the World War II era Superman, uh, Dr. Fate, the Spectre, the Flash, Green Lantern. He didn't want those. He wanted characters who had, for instance, no modern counterpart. All of those characters have modern 20th century counterparts. But also characters who've never really had the spotlight before. And he wanted the freedom to invent some characters, too, and add them into the continuity. And he was given that. He was given the freedom to do all that, and he did. So he revives a whole bunch of characters. You can see the World War II era Hawk Girl is there. Liberty Bell. Uh, Roy Thomas has a, had in his heyday a sweet tooth for so-called mystery men, which are ordinary people who put on domino masks and fight crime. They don't have any superpowers. They don't have any pretense to superpowers. They they, they're just ordinary people with hearts of gold. <laughs> they're plucky, ordinary people. And he had, a, he had a real penchant for that. He knew the name and secret identity of every mystery man that had ever been made. Uh, so he, he sort of crammed this team with uh, weaklings. That's <laughs> how I would put it. And being a fan of the old-time classic Justice League of America, I would say it's a team of weaklings. You have uh, Johnny Quick, who has super speed, but who's kind of a twit. Uh, a character named Firebrand, who's a, a, a minor... Pyro pyrokinetic she, she can't do much with it she's certainly not sun boy from the legion of superheroes she's she can maybe heat your chili for you, for you but she's plucky uh, you've got a, a, a robot that decides to fight crime and you have uh the shining knight this is a joe Kubert cover he didn't do the interior artwork the interior artwork was done at first by rich buckler doing a really good impersonation of neil adams and then rich buckler left and someone else came on board i don't remember that artist's name uh, I'm sorry to say, I don't know if this is going to tell me. I don't remember that the author, the artist name for who came on, but eventually even that artist was replaced by Jerry Ordway, who's terrific. He's fantastic, and he doesn't have to imitate anybody. He has a style of his own. So this is going to have a ton of great artwork in it, color or no color. Uh, and the main character on Joe Kubert's cover is the Shining Knight. 
an interesting character, a character who was put in suspended animation in the legendary days of King Arthur. Him and his winged horse <laughs> were put in suspended animation, and then they, they awaken in the modern era, and the Shining Knight decides to fight crime. He has his winged horse, he has his chainmail armor and his sword, uh, both of which are indestructible. He, so his armor is bulletproof, uh, which in, when All-Star Squadron was coming out as a monthly comic book, uh, it was previewed first in an issue of Justice League of America, which I was buying at the time. The preview was just stuck in the middle. You got a whole extra comic for the same cover price. And I read the preview, the sort of first appearance, which I think is in this volume. And I remember thinking, right then that day, surrounded by beagles, I remember thinking, boy, I wish they'd make a whole comic of this. And then they did, the next month. All Star Squadron started coming out. And some people were uh, obnoxiously pointing out in a letters column that, sure, the Shining Knight's armor and his sword are bulletproof. But he rides a gigantic winged horse who is not. <laughs> so it, w it wouldn't be all that much protection if he was fighting, you know, bad guys with Tommy guns. <laughs> but uh, all these characters get a ton of spotlight. And sure enough, the traditional characters from the Justice Society start showing up anyway. Even though they're not the focus, they start showing up anyway. I ate this up when it was coming out. But I don't think I'm ever going to see an all-star squadron, big, full-color, you know, lovingly restored, Michael K. Vaughn-style, $125 hardcover omnibus. I don't think I'm ever going to see that. If I do, this was a dollar. So, I, you know, I can, I, can, I can enjoy the stories all over again. Now I haven't read them since I read them originally. And then if, a, you know, a beautiful omnibus with... The color wasn't anything to write home about, so I'm not missing all that much. But another problem with these showcase editions and with the Marvel version of these black-and-white things isn't just that you're missing the color, it's that the, re the print quality isn't good. So it starts to wear off. Uh, it, it fades. The interior pages start to wear off as you turn the pages. This were clearly meant as stopgap measures just to make readers familiar with your vast back catalog, which is the whole point of reprint culture. It's not just that you're pleasing the older fanboys, it's that you're cultivating new fans. I don't know why DC does such a bad job of it. Marvel, every week, Without fail, Marvel has, in the, new, in the new releases of their comics, at least two or three beautifully well-done, full-color reprint volumes of something or other. A lot of times they're not of much interest to me, but at least they're there. DC? Ugh, not as often, and not as much, and it'll never be this, so I had to grab this. And that was it. That was my Brattle trip. Next time I go to the Brattle is going to be a, a Marco Polo traveling to Asia ordeal. <laughs> it's going to be multiple parts. It's going to be probably difficult, probably a cattle car. Uh, but uh, maybe the, the subway line in question will be repaired someday. <laughs> but we have, so we have comic books. We have the All-Star Squadron. A, a gigantic number of issues. How many issues are in here? Uh, Oh, yeah, there's like, there's like 30 issues in here. And see, there, there are some other showcase volumes. Uh, they did everything. They did their romance comics. They did uh, their horror comics and whatnot. So we have uh, the All-Star Squadron and also Black Mark by Gil Kane. Terrific. We have uh, five decades of short stories by Irwin Shaw. Uh, we have a pre-cancellation biography of John James Audubon. Uh, we have Original Sin in a durable hardcover, a replace book I just recently destroyed. Uh, we have The Stream by Robert Murphy, which I haven't read in forever. Can't wait to dive back in. We have The Master of Seacliff with chilly young Andrew on the cover there. <laughs> uh, we have, what's this called again? A Dangerous Thing by Josh Lanyon. Uh, murder mystery starring a, uh, a gay bookseller. Uh, and the, the, the Horns of the Buffalo, which is a British historical novel about Rourke's Drift. Uh, and I'm, I'm all primed to enjoy it and to notice where it differs from historical fact because I just read uh, what struck me as a pretty good history of Rock's Drift. So, uh, so there you go. That is a, a brattle trip uh, that I had multiple justifications for. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up. This has gone on way too long. But I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.